A Newstead Historical Society program, January 8, 1981, with Grace Howe, widow of Donald Howe of Howe Road, concerning the Howe family, who were early settlers in our town. And the family has been here for 150 years. They uh, came here, well, the original Howe came in 1628 into Massachusetts. Their descendants stayed in New England for most of that time, but eventually at least one of them settled in central New York someplace. And in 1831, Don's great-grandfather and his wife and a couple of children took a long journey up to Newstead, and they bought 100, well, the, the deed says 110 acres more or less. It was about 120 acres on what has become Howe Road. And they lived in a small log cabin, and so they built the house that I still live in. And uh, speaking of the house, there's a coin here that we took off the siding on one side of the house a number of years ago and discovered that this coin had been put in the cornerstone, as they often did. It's 1831. It's an English coin, all in Latin. So if anybody wants to look at it later. This is the original mortgage. Uh, Squire Howe bought the land, 120 acres, for $800 in May of 1831 and finally paid it off five years later. And it's been in the Howe family ever since, and mostly, most of that time, Howe's have lived in it. I got interested in the history of this area, mostly from listening to Don's father and uncle. They would talk and talk and talk, and they loved to talk, of course, and I had a very open ear to everything <laughs> that they were saying. And then a number of years after both Don's father and his uncle died, uh, I was talking to Don's cousin, and she discovered that they had some diaries that Darius was Don's grandfather, and he was born in this house in 1832. He became a school teacher and uh, around here first, and then he went down to Smith's Mills, which is near Silver Creek, met a woman there and married her and came back in 1858. He built the house across the road from us, and that's the year 1856 when he started to keep in Smith Mills is when he started to keep diaries. And he kept them every day for all the years until he died in 1909. I got interested in reading them, and I almost forgot that I was living in the 20th century because they were so interesting and so, they were very succinct, but they were in just a few lines, but it just said so much. Some of the things he talked about and some of the people he talked about, the, the names are still around. But a lot of you people, well, you apparently know as much as I do about these things, but these diaries would tell not just uh, facts about the people, but the, what, what was so interesting was the way they lived. For instance, we're talking about cold weather today. There was one year that they had 20 degree below zero weather several days in a row, and he couldn't even sleep. They only had a coal stove, a wood stove, and he'd have to sit up all night long just to keep that fire going. And they all would sit up with him because they didn't dare go to bed. They'd freeze to death. And we think we're cold. And I, these are the times when I begin to appreciate what today is like. He would tell how he planted. He kept an, an absolute meticulous record of everything. Every day he would write exactly what the weather was like because, of course, farmers in those days lived by the weather. Really, it would be, I told Gladys, it would be a meteorologist's dream to read these diaries because it was absolutely perfect. Every single day, the weather, the temperature, what it was like. One thing he hated was the spring. Mud, he used to write, mud, 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 in great big letters, because he couldn't stand the mud. And he'd have to take these big logs, put them out in the middle of the street so that he could get his horse and buggy through the mud. But he loved the snow. Because then he could take the, I guess, what would you call a sleigh, and go right across the top of all the fences and everything else, and he didn't have to stop for anything. He, he would plant, and apparently thought he was a pretty good farmer because he said his rows were always nice and straight. He kept a record of what he planted, and then he kept also a record of every single thing that he harvested. Then several things that you speak about money today in the back of these diaries, he would keep a record of what he had spent in actual cash. 
for the year. Sometimes it would be $29. Sometimes it would be $35. Sugar was nine cents a, a pound. Eggs were 10 cents a dozen. Everything else, of course, he bought molasses, bought some flour, but just the simplest things. Another thing that was interesting to me was the way people borrowed money from one another. Apparently, they didn't go to banks. Maybe banks were not very, there weren't very many of them, were they, in those days? Anyway, he would, when he was short on money, he would go and borrow. Maybe $25, maybe $50, 2% interest. Helen, did you hear that? 2% <coughs> interest. <laughs> and he loaned money. Whenever he had it, he would loan it to other people. And there was all these meticulous records kept of all these things. And the interesting thing was that people always paid it back, right, on the day it was due. Helen, do they do that today? <laughs> also, um, he'd get up at 2 in the morning and pack his wagon in the fall with all the vegetables and things, fruits and things, take them to Buffalo or take them to Williamsville. If he went to Williamsville, he could peddle them during the day and come back at night. If they went to Buffalo, he'd have to stay over a couple of days because it took so long. Can you imagine how long it would take you to Buffalo in a wagon? Does anybody have any idea? <laughs> anyway, this is what he used to do. And the, another interesting thing was that his, um, the pears were more expensive than apples or anything else. And I, I don't know why, but maybe they're so expensive today, I never buy them. He told a lot of personal things. One thing that um, would, have, would have interested me as a cook, when people would visit, they would drop in unexpectedly. Nobody knew they'd be coming, and the whole family would come. And instead of staying for a couple of hours, they'd stay for a week. And I thought, good Lord, how did anybody ever get food enough to take care of all these people? But they would do the same thing. Another thing was the railroads. They would apparently be, have somebody write to them, tell them they were coming at a certain time, and he would go to the railroad station, and they wouldn't come. So he'd go back the next train, and they wouldn't come. And this might go on for a couple of days before the people finally got here. Good Lord, of all the disruptions in your life. He was not only a farmer, he sold safes, and he sold insurance. He was a notary public and apparently wrote up the wills for a large number of people around. One of the saddest things in the diary to me was the children. In the summertime, there would be three and four babies die every week. And he would just, you know, it was just one of the things that I guess that people did. Another thing about sick people, they would take turns sitting with a person that was really very ill. No doctors around or at least not many of them. And so they would just go and sit for 12 hours, and then somebody else would take over and sit for another 12 hours until the person got well or died. And I thought, gee, that's kind of neighborly and kind of nice. Is there anybody here that goes to the Hunts Corners Baptist Church? Darius was one of the founders of the Hunts Corners Baptist Church. And every single Sunday, they went to church, come no matter what weather, and he always kept a record exactly of the text of the service. And whether it was any good or whether it wasn't any good, too. <laughs> and at the end of 40 years, he wrote up a history of the church, which I understand is still in the archives. He uh, was very fond of Reverend Hunt. And when he died, they all felt very badly. Uh, pastors apparently did not get a salary in those days because they would take well, a bushel of corn or a bushel of potatoes or a bushel of something else every couple of weeks. But all the people did this, take them to the pastor. Then twice a year, they would have a, a money Sunday, and everybody in the church would go to that particular service and give a certain amount of money to, to cover the pastor's actual expenses if he didn't, you know, if he didn't get any other way. When Pastor Hunt died, they had quite a time finding somebody else. <coughs> but they finally got a man from out of town. And they didn't have any place for him to live. So Darius fixed up my house <coughs> and let him live there until they could build a house for him. 
But the funny part of it was that uh, uh, his mother had died, and they'd been having a couple of tenant farmers live in the house. And so he felt it should be fixed up a little bit. So he bought paint. He bought some new window sills and some new windows and was absolutely indignant because it cost him $29 for all the paint for that big house. <laughs> it, the money was quite different from what it is today, and it was interesting to see the way they used it. He uh, also told about when they built the house for the pastor of the Hunts Corners Baptist Church. They all would devote a certain number of hours each day, all the men, and they went over and they dug the hole for the, uh, for the house and they put in all the basement, and he kept a record of how they did all these things. And I thought, I wonder how many people could do that today. I think a lot of people in church would help a minister. Like, we helped them. Maybe other people helped Reverend Vandegrift. But this was to build the entire house. And then he, he lived in this house, in my house, until that was done. There were uh, some interesting little sidelights. He wrote one day, Mary went to Akron to do some shopping, and she came home with a new hat. I told her it looked like a pot turned upside down. <laughs> then there wasn't any mention of Mary for two or three days, and I sort of think maybe she didn't speak to him for a while. <laughs> there were uh, very interesting notes about the ch his children and grandchildren. One of his children, grandchildren became blind at the age of about 10. Uh, I never really did. Nobody seemed to know exactly why. And they took her to New York. They took her everywhere they could think of to get help. But apparently it was irreversible, and she finally ended up in Batavia at the School for the Blind. Isn't there one in Batavia? Mm -hmm. And she could only she only stayed a few hours. She was so homesick she couldn't stand it, so they had to go and get her. And they took her back two or three times until finally she got used to it and stayed. And this woman, who was blind the rest of her life, became a very well-known masseuse and, and supported herself the rest of her life, just from things that she'd learned at this Batavia Home for the Blind. I think it's pretty wonderful that they do these kind of things. He. Uh, he told about an awful lot of fires. This is another thing when I think about people using wood stoves today. There were so many fires in those days, one right after the other. And the place would burn right down to the ground. A lot of it was from the creosote that formed from this, with the wood stoves. Apparently, they didn't realize then, or somebody didn't realize, that you had to clean out your, what do you call them, stove pipes? Yeah. And if you don't, that forms a So I can remember my aunt's house down on the farm. The walls would just be covered with this horrible black creosote. And this would catch on fire if you had too hot a fire. And these were the way the homes would be burned. Once in a great while, I think two or three times in all those years, he mentioned that some, some man had committed suicide, which apparently was quite unusual because it upset everybody very much. He kept a pretty good record of his um, of his family. He was very devoted to his family, except uh, he only had one daughter. And I don't know just what happened, but he wrote, he didn't say something, oh, the day before she was to be married, he said, Mary's busy getting Anna ready for her wedding. And the next day, Anna was married today, and I suppose it's all right. <laughs> Which I didn't think was, I told his, his uh, his grandson, who was the, one of the children of this marriage, and he was very indignant to think that his <laughs> grandfather had said that. He also adopted two of his nieces. Their parents had died. He brought them here and supported them, educated them. One of them became two of them. Both, they both became teachers for a while. And apparently one of the girls had a very heavy suitor and Darius wasn't too pleased about it. So he put in the diary, I went to find out all the information I could about this man. And about three days later, I told off so-and-so and told him never to come to my niece again. So apparently he found out that he wasn't the kind of man that he wanted. 
Maybe men don't do that today. I don't know. But in those days, apparently, they looked up for their female people. But he made lots of trips over to Kern Center. He mentions lots of people in there that uh, still, the descendants still live in Clarence Center, in Clarence and Akron. He was supervisor of the town of Clarence for a while. He was very active in the political life here, at least according to his diary. Uh, oh, dear. What more can I tell you? He was a nature boy, you see. Oh, yes. Not that much, yes. In the diary, every spring, he would tell when he first, he first heard the big bullfrogs pee. Another time, there was, um, in February, he wrote, I saw a bluebird today, but whoever heard of seeing a bluebird in February? Well, I never saw one that early, but he watched for all these things. Everything was, uh, everything was nature, as Gladys said. It was uh, just a part of their life, I guess, a part of every day. And they noticed everything and saw everything and did everything. If some of you men would like to trim your waistlines, you might have followed him when he would cut two and three cords of wood a day, all by himself. I of course, they had to. Two other funny things I thought, uh, well, it wasn't, the first one wasn't funny, but he finally got a coal stove. And he was so thrilled to think that he wouldn't have to stay up all night or get up during the night to keep that stove going. I can't remember how much it was. It was something like $10 or something, but it was an awful lot of money to him. And then, in the late late 1890s, I think it was, Don's father was an engineer. And he was home visiting one time. And he, they decided to make a bathroom, which had, they'd never had, of course, before. So they cut off a part of the kitchen, walled it off. And uh, Father Hal made a hole in the floor so that the water could drain through. And they bought a bathtub. And he was so thrilled. He said, I had my first bath in a bathtub today. And what did I tell you it cost? Nine dollars. Nine dollars in some sense. And it was this great big heavy iron bathtub with the, you know, the feet and everything that everybody's looking for today. So when I read that, I called Norma Neubauer, who lives in that house now. And I said, Norma, I can tell you when you got your bathtub. And she said, when? I said, well, 1890 or whatever it was. And she said, yeah, and it still looks like it. <laughs> and I said, why didn't you change it? And she said, Dick won't let me. He wants to keep the bathroom just the way it is. So somebody else likes history and likes old things. That house is a lovely old place. It's, um, we were talking about houses with Ellsworth. It has been changed some. The living room over there now is, um, well, it takes two nine by 12 rugs and then another one. But that was three rooms at one time. There were two bedrooms and a living room. Now, my house um, hasn't been changed that much. The only changes in it, there was, there were two connecting rooms, but they were connected because one was a boarding room where people had their babies or when people were sick, they kept them isolated. And you could only enter it through a doorway between the two rooms. So that wall has been closed off and the door made into the hall. And the pantry has been made into a bathroom, thank goodness. And that's about the only two changes in, in my house. Uh, this came up because Ellsworth said so many old homes were changed fundamentally in some way, but this one hasn't but been. you said you did have glass beside the door. The yes, I, the... Um, the front door has two panels. This is a picture that my daughter took of the house this last summer and had it enlarged from it. And the front door used to have two panels, glass on either side. Apparently it was broken or something, and they just closed it off. And I'm sorry, because I think that would have been nice. There used to be a little tiny porch outside this door, just a step, and that was taken off. The rest of the house remains the same. The woodshed and everything is still intact. And boy, it looks 150 years old, I can tell you. <laughs> um, I was trying to, I don't think of anything else particularly, but what we were talking about the other day, Gladys, that you kept a record of anything there? You've pretty well covered what I have notes yeah. on. Uh -huh. He, uh, 
His wife. How does the hell name Uriah be only had one daughter? Oh, Don, who, Darius? Yes. He had two sons, Don's father, or Don's grandfather, and um, Don's father, Darius had Don's father and another son, Edwin, who was a school teacher in Buffalo, and this one daughter. And he brought up the two other girls. And then when he died, Don's father took this, our side of the street. There were 90 acres there. And Uncle Ed took the other side, which there was 30. And then they figured it out financially and paid off their sister for the difference. And that's why I suppose this house has stayed the same because somebody's been in it most of the time. It, uh, I've done a lot of fixing since I've been here. But before that, there really hadn't been very much done. People just kind of lived in it, I guess, the way they, the way they could. In fact, when Don first came out there after college and started in the chicken business, he had an incubator in the dining room, what is now the dining room. It's a good thing I wasn't around at the time, because <laughs> it wouldn't have gone over very big. You mentioned the grandfather. Uh, and he had a father there who settled. And he, I don't think Squire. I mentioned his name. Squire. His name was Squire Howe. Um, he, he was the one who came from the central part of New York State. And they came by, well, one one relative says they came by wagon, and one relative said they came, they came by the Erie Canal. So I really don't know which it is. But they did come in the early spring of 1831, and that's when they bought this place. And he was Squire Howe. He died quite a while before his wife did. Oh, another interesting thing. When his mother died and when his father died, Darius wrote that he had to make the coffin for his parents. And I, uh, I had never heard of that before. I suppose a lot of people did. They didn't have the money to buy coffins. But that's what he did. Then I don't know where they were buried first. But in one of the diaries, he mentioned, uh, I, moved, I moved all the coffins today to the new cemetery. And the new cemetery is that cemetery up on the main road that is next to the flea market. Because that's where they're square and they're all buried. Uh, it was a hard life. Oh, the work they did. And I, it, when you read what he did some days, you just couldn't imagine that one man could do it all. As he got older and his wife got sick, he took care of her a great deal. Uh, well, then he would hire somebody to come in and help him cut the wood, I guess for the real heavy work. Most of the time, I guess most everything he did was by himself. But they, uh, they had no doctors. His brother, Darius had an older brother who was a doctor in the Civil War. And twice, Darius's wife became what he said was quite ill. And he would take her over somewhere near Alden was where this man lived and leave her there for five or six weeks until she got better. And he was just perfectly miserable without her. All through this whole thing, there was a real, really lovely love story. He apparently loved this woman very much. Oh, I must tell about those letters. When he was, when he was teaching down at Smith's Mills, he apparently met this lady. And he was home on summer vacation. I think the second year. And Madonna's cousin, uh, Mary, found these letters in her father's secretary. So we were looking at them one night. And it seems that Mary wrote to Darius and said he had been her friend for some time, and she wanted to ask him a very serious question. She said some man was very interested in her and wanted to marry her, but she didn't think she loved him. She thought she loved somebody else. And she wondered what she should do. And I said, boy, if that doesn't sound modern enough today. <laughs> it was worded very nicely, of course, and very ladylike. And they were married for the next few months, so I think maybe it worked. <laughs> and I, I, I think from all of it, you find that people haven't changed very much in the way they do things or the way they live. Maybe our younger generation has changed a little bit, but not most of them. That is how about it? Is that well, that's, uh, that's fine. Anybody have any questions or any yeah. comments? If you would like to look at this, this is the original mortgage that was made out when 
Squire bought the house or the land in 1831, and I won't pass it because it's really very fragile. But if you want to see this coin, I think this is very interesting too. It's copper, I guess. What did you say? It looks like. And it's very English. It's all in Latin. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a real find. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to look at it, fine. The question I've got isn't directed to you specifically, but to the history bus here, I'm sure it had the answer. When did the West Shore, when was the West Shore Railroad constructed through here? You mentioned, yes, you said that he would go to the railroad mm -hmm. station two or three days in a row. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking is because I want to find out a little bit now that I'm becoming mildly interested in old buildings because Lucille is becoming interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah I'm, uh, I'm sure that uh, the old Bernhardt House over in Clarence was there before the railroad. I think it was there before the railroad. The one that's right next to the railroad. The one that was the Bernhardt House. And it's right close to the railroad there in Clarence yeah. on Main Street. I got it. I don't know. Does anyone know? When Hannah might know. Do you know, Hannah, when the West Shore I came through? When the West Shore came through. How about the peanut? The peanut was here first. Yes. I and think it was here quite a while before the Shore mm -hmm. came through. And the West Shore came through as an independent road. And the Central bought it out. Mm -hmm. it didn't want the competition. Okay. They didn't buy it out. Now I'm sorry. They rented it for 19, leased it for 99 years. Mm -hmm. That was right on their ticket. Mm -hmm. Jim, you, Jim, you, you said it there. Yeah, 1884. West Shore, 1884. When the West Shore came through. And, yeah. The other I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking you later. Yeah, when I come to <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he thinks he thinks to do some things, yeah. Anyone else have any comment or any uh, questions? When are you going to write your book? Who, me? <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, there's so much, though. I, I, I wish I had the diaries, really. Uh, Marion Harmon has. It,